Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's The Garden Hour with MU Extension. We're so happy to have you here. Uh, a month to a month to a month waiting to provide you with lots of information. At times, I'm just sitting there going, I have so much I want to share with everyone. We all feel that way with Extension. Uh, we love sharing our information. And so a month to a month seems like a long, long time. But we're very happy that you guys are here. And so we've, we've got questions that have come in. And so we're going to answer those for you. I do want to go ahead and let you know um, that here is the map of all of us that are part of the horticulture field specialists across the state. You'll notice that we're all color coded to what counties we serve. If there's no one that's associated with the county where you are living, don't fret about that. Just contact one of the others of us and we'll be happy to answer those questions for you. I do want to let you know that we have a new person who's joined our team and we are so happy to have him. His name is Manoj Chetri and he is up in the northwestern part of the state and he actually is going to answer one of our questions for us today. So you get to meet him and we're happy to have him with us. So what I'd like to do, we've got tons of information. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Pat Ganan and he's going to get us jump started with doing the weather report for us. I'm sure he's got some very interesting information to share. I do, Debbie, thank you. Let me find my, my presentation here. Can you see my screen? I see your, oh, now I'm starting to see it. Do you see the presentation? It, yes, I do. Awesome. It is, yep, thank you. Uh, thanks, Debbie. I'm gonna get right into it. We got a a lot going on over the next 24 to 36 hours. Real briefly, just to look back where we where we are here in February, we're halfway through the month and uh, temperatures for the most part across the state have been running below average. They're, the exception to that is Northwestern sections, which has been a little bit above normal. Uh, but we had a big snowstorm back in early February that left a blanket of snow across much of the state. Uh, not necessarily Northwest Missouri, but the rest of the state. And so that actually kind of kept temperatures a little colder. And we're running below average across much of the rest of the Missouri, generally one to three degrees below average. On the right, uh, precipitation, of course, we had that significant event um, back in early February and um, quite notable amounts. We're running a little bit above average in these areas of green. Um, slightly near to below average across the rest of the state. Ignore this in... Um, here just was the Kansas City, That's, that shouldn't be there. Nonetheless, we've had some better precip across East Central Missouri and parts of Southern parts of the state to help uh, relieve some of the drier conditions that we saw prior to the snow event. So today it's, it's very spring-like right now. We're looking outside in the upper left. These are temperatures from less than a half hour ago. You can see this is more like mid-April versus mid-February. February, we have really mild temperatures running well above average, more than 20 degrees above average. Generally in the lower to middle 60s across much of the state, upper 50s across Northern Missouri. With these milder conditions over the past couple of days, we've actually seen um, warmer soil temperatures and you know that's gonna impact the, the ice that starts to fall and snow starting to fall where we'll get a little bit of melting with these warmer soil temperatures. Colder conditions across Northern Missouri, we still have a frost line. Uh, no frost line generally across the southern half of the state. And so any precipitation that falls in the form of rain uh, will percolate through the soil and help uh, recharge that soil profile across much of the rest of Missouri. But then again, we still have some frozen conditions and, and deeper depths across northern parts of the state. In the upper right, this is what we're, we're going through over the next 24 to 36 hours. There's a lot of hazardous and warnings and advisories impacting our state with a major storm system, very spring-like in nature, but it's gonna bring all varieties of precipitation from rain to ice and thunderstorms. Uh, we have winter weather advisories across northern parts of the state, winter storm warnings. This is where that most impactful area for winter precip is in the shade of pink running from near right Kansas City to Quincy. That's the, what the forecasters are thinking is where we're gonna see the most um, snowfall from the system. Uh, rain and thunderstorms impacting southeastern, east central southeastern parts of the state could bring quite a bit of rainfall. They have a flood watch in these green counties. 
These are high wind watches uh, impacting parts of Southwest and Southeast. And it's windy throughout the state. We're gonna see winds 20 to 30, even gusting over 40 miles per hour, most uh, likely across West Central and Southwestern sections. So some very windy conditions with this strong storm system. In the lower left, there is actually a forecast of severe thunderstorms, especially tomorrow impacting Southeast Missouri, something to keep an eye on. Again, it's a spring-like system with winter to the north and, and more like spring-like conditions in Southeast Missouri with the potential for some severe thunders and severe thunderstorms in far southeastern parts of the state. This image right here does is a forecast that it's a gridded forecast from the National Weather Service. I put the web link here on the bottom on how to access this information. These are forecast precipitation totals over the next couple of days. That'll take us through midnight Friday. So the core of this precip is a look at the, some of these totals over an inch, an inch and a half, over two inches. And that's why they have these flood watches across much of East Central and Southern parts of the state. But generally much of the state, it looks like is gonna pick up over an inch of precipitation, especially about the south, southern, southeastern, I'd say three quarters of the state. Unfortunately, where it's been dry up in Northwest Missouri, it looks like they're gonna miss out on any notable precipitation with this current storm system. Right here, this, this image here shows the anticipated snowfall totals over the next 24 to 36 hours. You can see that belt of heavy snow generally extending from Kansas City to Quincy, anywhere from four to seven inches of snow is anticipated. You know, it could be a little bit conservative if we have any thunder snow with this, with this system that can bring those totals even higher. So something to keep an eye on with these winter storm warning conditions impacting much of uh, western, north central, and northeast Missouri. Here on the bottom right, this is an ice forecast. There are, it is going to be a wintry mix across parts of the state. We're gonna get some freezing rain, some sleet and snow. Looks like the highest concentration of the heaviest ice will generally extend from parts of southwest, right around the Jeff City into parts of northeast Missouri. So something to keep an eye on. Of course, you don't want a lot of freezing rain that can create a lot of um, not good conditions when it comes to tree limbs and power lines. I think the big issue though is gonna be the heavier snow that we're gonna see across this area here in blue. This is the forecast of temperatures, high and low temperatures over the next four days that'll take us through the weekend. Uh, here on the max temperatures for um, tomorrow, uh, you can see where that, that cold front is with the cold Arctic air to the north. Uh, we're still battling, uh, that those temperatures are battling out against each other with that storm system, uh, the surface low in Southeast Missouri. High temperatures tomorrow, even in Southeast Missouri, could still be in the mid 60s. Of course, there's a potential for some severe thunderstorms for tomorrow across Southeast parts of the state. The rest of the state here in Northern half of the state will see more of that snow and ice. Low temperatures for tomorrow morning. Generally, you can see where that freezing line is extending from Southwest or Central and Northeast Missouri warmer conditions in Southeast Missouri. Uh, high temperatures on Friday, a little bit cooler where they're anticipating a, a band of snow uh, already to have accumulated and laying on the ground. And so that'll keep those temperatures a little bit cooler for Friday. Look at these low temperatures on Friday morning, single digits to even below zero. Of course, if you have a heavy snow blanket, that's gonna enhance the radiative cooling with calm winds, clear skies, temperatures can really bottom out on Friday morning. A little bit more moderation on Saturday. It looks like those southerly winds are gonna come back. Look at highs rebounding back into the 50s for Saturday. The snow blanket across Northern Missouri will keep those temperatures from getting too much higher, generally staying in the 30s, low temperatures on Saturday morning in the 20s. And then on Sunday, more moderation. We're gonna get some more snow melt, high temperatures reaching all of Missouri in the lower 50s and generally back into the 60s. So actually it looks like a decent weekend shaping up after we get through this winter storm. This is the forecast over the next couple days. Uh, that This is the big system that's gonna be impacting us over the next few days. Uh, I, this is the forecasted precip over the next couple days. You can see generally the Southeastern three quarters of the state, anywhere from one to two inches of precipitation, lighter amounts as you go northward and westward through Northwestern parts of Missouri. We are in a stormy pattern. Of course, we have to get through this major storm over the next 24 to 36 hours. This is the forecast for next week. When I see something like this with below normal temperatures to our west, above normal temperatures to our east, Missouri is in that battle zone uh, with these air masses, these contrasting air masses. It does look like we are mostly on the warmer side 
that would put highs likely getting back in again for Sunday in the 60s, but then back into the 50s and 60s for next week. But also with that stormy pattern with, again, cold to the west, warm to the east, uh, we're going to see a storm system that could perhaps impact us by early as early next week with more uh, a higher likelihood. These darker shades of green in, enhance an enhanced likelihood of above normal precipitation. So um, buckle your seatbelt. We're in for a, a bumpy ride over the next 24 to 36 hours, a little bit nicer conditions for the weekend, but it looks like a stormy pattern setting up for next week. Debbie, that's pretty much a weather report. I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pat. We always enjoy having you around to give us the forecast to let us know what some of the extremes might be in different areas of the state. And as we all know, if we're born and bred in Missouri, live here for all of our lives. We know that it's very easy for our weather to be one temperature one day and that evening or the next morning be totally different. So we enjoy having you here. What I'd like to do is go ahead and turn this over to Jennifer Shooter up in Kirksville and she's gonna be the moderator for us for today. Jennifer. Thank you, Debbie. And yes, hello from Kirksville, Missouri, the frigid Northeast part of the state. But uh, today and yesterday has been quite mild and actually pretty nice. But like Pat said, we are in for a winter storm. We are expecting some ice and some snow later on this evening and tomorrow. But then again, I saw, you know, just in a few days, it's gonna be back up in the, the 50s. So that will be nice uh, to have. Okay, well, moving on to our questions. We had a question come in about planting wildflowers. And the question reads, I'd like to learn more about planting wildflowers. I collected seed from my neighbor's prairie garden and I know where I would like to start mine, but I'm reading many various ideas on bed preparation and seed sowing. And Kelly McGowan is gonna answer that question for us. Okay, can you see my screen, Jennifer? Yes, I can. Okay, very good. Okay, well, thank you to whoever sent in this uh, question. It's a very good question about sowing wildflower seeds. And this is a great time of the year to start thinking about that. Okay, if I can get my slides to advance. Okay, so uh, the first thing that I wanted to mention is some reasons why you should plant wildflowers or native plants. And these are, there, there's lots and lots of reasons, but these are just a few of the most common reasons. Uh, wildflowers and native plants, once they're established in the area, they're, they're pretty low maintenance. Now you still have to do weeding and things like that, but they're, they're pretty low maintenance. So that's a great reason just right there. And of course, they're a great food and habitat source for all of our native insects, birds, animals. And if you've ever grown wildflowers before and you've had them covered with bees and butterflies, you know that it's just spectacular to be able to watch that in your own backyard. Um, wildflowers, if you have a good mix of wildflowers, you're going to have blooms throughout the growing season, which is not only great for us to look at, but again, it's good for our native insects and animals that might be out there. And of course, they're perennial plants that come back year after year. Okay, well, the question was about preparing the seed bed. How do I start wildflower seeds? And there's a couple of different ways that you can go about doing this. Um, you can start with just a blank slate. And if you, this is especially good if you just have a really small area that you want to convert to wildflowers. Um, you can do this blank slate method. And basically you're just gonna remove all of the existing vegetation. You're gonna create this smooth seed bed, and then you're just gonna broadcast your seed over the area and cover it with straw. Now you do wanna monitor this closely for weeds and you do wanna keep it weeded because very small seedlings of any kind cannot compete with weeds or, or a lawn grass. So just uh, keep it weeded until those plants start to get some growth on them. Now, if you already have a meadow or kind of a naturalized area where you want to add some additional wildflower seeds, 
Um, one of the great ways that you can do this is just to broadcast those seeds evenly over that area. And the best time to do this is before a snow event, which it sounds like we're going to be getting in the next few days. And so here at the Springfield Botanical Gardens, where my office is located, we have a um, kind of a prairie display here at the park, and it's called the Kickapoo Edge Prairie. And this is the way that we add wildflower seeds to this prairie area. We go out before a snow event and we just broadcast those seeds over the entire area. And that's really about it. And then as the snow falls, it just kind of helps to carry those seeds down to the soil layer and there they can germinate and get going. So this is kind of an easy way to do it if you already have a naturalized area. So just a couple of things to keep in mind when planting wildflowers is sometimes that the sometimes the seedlings can be difficult to identify and differentiate from weeds. And we get a lot of questions about this, especially as we go into spring and wildflower seeds start to germinate. People might not remember that they planted certain seeds in certain areas and they'll start to see things grow. Um, so do keep this in mind. You might not realize that it's a wildflower seedling. Um, and if you do have questions about that, you can certainly send photos to any of us and we can help you identify those. Um, do keep in mind that the germination rate for wildflower seeds can sometimes be low. You might have a huge bag of seeds and you might go out and broadcast those over an area. And especially if it's kind of the naturalized type of an area, very few of those seeds are gonna germinate. So you'll need a lot of seed to cover that area. So you're not gonna get a flower from every single seed. So keep that in mind as well. And native plants sometimes have a reputation of being kind of unruly and unsightly, especially if you're used to a well manicured lawn or flower beds at your home. Um, so really these naturalized areas are a great choice for wildflowers. Um, but if you do wanna keep them more under control, planting them in native soil can help to keep them under control. If you plant wildflowers in areas where you have this great compost or well amended soil, those wildflowers are gonna love that. They're gonna take off, they're gonna grow like crazy. But if you plant them in just our native soils, that's gonna to help to kind of keep them under control and they're not gonna spread as much as they would in great soil areas. Um, if you are gonna plant them in landscape beds, be aware of the mature size. A lot of them will get very tall. So it may be something that you wanna plant at the back of a border. So do keep those in mind as well. But again, pollinator strips or naturalized areas are a great choice for wildflowers. Now, just a couple of things to keep in mind with wildflowers is out in nature, um, these seeds go through um, either something called stratification or scarification to help break down a very hard outer seed coat. The first of those is stratification, and that's just exposing seeds to a cool, moist condition to help to break down the seed coat and to help them germinate. And, you know, I talked about spreading the seeds before a snow, and of course, that's how it's done out in nature. You can also do this in your refrigerator quite successfully. I've done this lots of time with milkweed seeds, and basically, you just put some milkweed seeds in a Ziploc bag with a damp paper towel, not soaking wet, just damp, and put it in your refrigerator for a couple of weeks, and that can really help to speed up germination. Now, some seeds need scarification, and this is basically just scratching the seed to remove a little bit of that outer seed coat. And you can do that with a file, you can do that with sandpaper, and you basically just wanna scratch a little bit of that outer seed coat to expose the inner part of the seed to help speed up germination. 
Now out in nature, this happens when birds eat seeds. And as those seeds go through the digestive tract of the bird, and they're exposed to the um, kind of acidic environment of that digestive tract, that helps to break down that outer seed coating. And then when the bird poops out the seed, that scarification has already happened. And then that seed can germinate. And another way that you can um, speed up the germination of wildflower seeds and be ready for the spring is to do what we call winter seed sowing. And this is often done in this kind of you're basically making a little greenhouse out of milk jugs. And we've done segments on this before, kind of walking you through the steps, but this helps to, um, you know, germinate those seeds ahead of time. And then you can just transplant those seeds um, once we get into the growing season. So Jennifer, that's all I have. All right, thank you, Kelly. Our next question is on apple trees. And the question is, I just bought a home with two apple trees that have those smudge spots all over the fruit. And a third of the leaves were brown before fall. Is this two separate problems and what can I do to help them? And Katie Kamler is gonna answer this question. Hello, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. All right. Uh, so it's hard to say exactly what the problem is without seeing some pictures or um, uh, some diagnostic work, but uh, just a couple quick common apple diseases that we see here in Missouri. Uh, so apple scab is one of those. Uh, you can see that it can have spots on the leaves and it can also have spots on the fruit. And depending on when this disease starts in the season, uh, as you can see in this small picture, um, it started very early and that can cause um, complete crop damage, or it can be later in the season where um, this scab at the, this uh, top center picture is more cosmetic. So not exactly great for marketing, but um, for a home apple production, you can peel the apples and be just fine. Another common disease is um, sooty blotch and fly speck. So the sooty blotch are the bigger spots and fly speck looks uh, like these little spots uh, on the apple. Once again, cosmetic on this one, um, it really doesn't go beyond skin deep. And actually, if you took a rag and rubbed on it, a lot of times that um, comes off, just not as appealing once again. Uh, and this was a picture of um, a homeowner's produced apples. Another common disease that we see is cedar apple rust. Uh, so this has two hosts. It has um, the cedar, which you can see in that center picture, and that's the fungal bloom um, in Missouri. You can see in the springtime, sometimes cedars look like they're decked out for uh, Christmas with those orange fungal blooms. And then those spores move to the apples, and you can see the leaf form of that. They're kind of um, yellow spots with pink centers almost, and it can get severe enough that it can defoliate trees. It can also be on the apples themselves. Then another common apple disease is fire blight. Uh, so this one, um, you actually see entire branches that turn brown and then they have what's called the shepherd's crook. So that end of the branch tips over a lot of times. So that's another common uh, disease that we see in apples. Now, what do you do about them? So disease prevention, um, one thing that helps a lot is good pruning and that allows good airflow, which allows plants to dry in our hot, humid summers and drier plants lead to less disease problems. Uh, and the other thing is to follow a spray schedule. So on um, this guide sheet is our spray schedule for all fruits, but um, the section on apples and pears goes through um, when you start spraying for each particular problem. And uh, that's just a, a quick uh, way to, to go through it and great information and lots of options, whether you are organic or conventional. And uh, that's uh, all I've got on apple diseases. Thank you, Katie. 
Our next question that came in is a long question. And the question reads, we didn't get around to aeration and overseeding in the fall. Is it helpful to the lawn to aerate and overseed in the spring? Or is it a waste of grass seed? And our new horticulture specialist, Manoj Chetri, is going to answer this question. Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? I can hear you and I can see your presentation. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I'm very excited uh, to go on and then um, have you all here in this call. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about core aeration on lawn. Just before answering that question straight out, I want to build up some background on that. The easy answer for that question is yes or no. It can go both ways. So I'm going to explain why yes and why no. That's my slides. It's not going. Okay. So benefits of aeration, you know, um, the first and foremost, when it comes to aerations, we want to break up the thatch. So when we say thatch on the turf grass, we are talking about the dead organic matter that builds off just below the grass, but above the soil line. And that thatch layer is um, is not very beneficial to the turf grass systems. We want to minimize the depth of that thatch as much as possible. And the only way we can break that thatch layer is from the aerations, basically punching holes, being aggressive on that with any kind of core aerations or other equipments like vertical cutters and things like that. The goal here is to as much as dilute that layer so that we can manage our turf grass systems more um, easily and can get in control. Because this layer is, is affecting us, our turf grass systems in many, many ways. Uh, for example, the soil is very, uh, very far from the root systems and air temperature regulations and things like that uh, is very hard to manage with uh, deeper or a very uh, heavy thatch layer. The second thing is relief of compaction. So anything compactions comes from traffic, foot traffic, or if you have cars parking and go home, things like that, uh, it's gonna build up. Uh, and it's all kinds of traffic will, will, uh, will help to, what do you say that like uh, all the airy space that we have, it's gonna go out. I mean, it's gonna get compressed, all the soil is gonna get in that pores and uh, your turf can suffer, especially your roots. Uh, another important point is the vertical movement of water and nutrients. Uh, uh, when you have very compacted and patchy turf, uh, there is not much movement of water and nutrients between the roots uh, and your soil particles and that's gonna hurt your turf. Uh, promotes gas exchange. As, as we know, the roots gonna um, exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen, and with that, uh, poor aerations in the soil, that's gonna be affected, and does uh, eventually you don't have good root system development. So, with the with the good aerations, routine aerations, you're gonna promote newer and deeper root growth. And then questions. Next questions comes in mind is when to aerate. Uh, and an easy answer for that is whenever your grass is growing actively. And we have two different grass here, cool season turf grass. Um, most of the homeowners uh, in this region, we have cool season, but some homeowners may also have warm season turf grass like Georgia grass. In cool season turf grass like tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, fine fescue, and those type of turf grass, uh, they actively grow. Uh, they like cooler portion of the year in the spring and in the fall, but in the middle of summer, because of excessive heat, they do not grow actively. And therefore, the best time to do the aerations for those cool season turf grass will be in spring, in March, April, and then in fall, in September. Uh, in contrast, if you are talking about warm season like Zoeja, then we do the cool aerations only in the summer when they are growing actively. In the fall and springtime, when temperatures are lower, they do not grow 
as much as in summer, and therefore uh, we have to target the aerations in Georgia grass in late May through July. Okay, so uh, so some of you may ask why why the specific time periods um, why why targeting the growing seasons? Uh, the reason is to allow the grass to grow back and fill that holes that was left behind by these core uh, aerations or pulling the plugs. Okay. If you do not do uh, in active growing seasons, then like in summer, for instance, for tall fescue, they do not have uh, enough vigor on the system to recover quickly and fill that holes. Okay, then how often to air it? Uh, once a year, twice a year? That's a very common question. So a general rule of thumb for a healthy growing, dense looking um, uh, yard, once a year is an ideal conditions. Mm -hmm. But if your yard, uh, if your lawn is suffering, suffering and there's a lot of berry spots, teeny stands, then maybe once a year might not be enough. You have to be a little aggressive and do twice a year. And when we say twice a year, that means in fall and in spring. Uh, so you cannot do two times in the spring or two times in the fall. Uh, so you would be better off spreading them out once in the fall and once in the spring because you want your turf to recover, grow back, recover and fill that holes uh, left behind by the uh, core aerator machines. And then sites with poor drainage, um, issue of severe compactions, heavy clay soils and those type of sites that they need more than once. And there are some, I mean, I found these on all lines. Uh, so there are some of these um, fancy looking options and, and, uh, and there's no data actually um, to suggest that this is gonna actually work. So if you, if you want to grow a healthy yard, uh, do actual correlations, uh, do some, um, uh, allow your roots to develop and, um, and work then, um, these will not be your ideal options. You have to rent out the correlations and do the hard work. And with the aerations comes the next question is the seeding. Uh, you know, generally uh, when, you, when you want to fill in the patches that are in your yard, um, if, it's, if your turf is thin and you want to grow vigorous and, and dense turf, then you want to overseed uh, the lawn uh, to help grow dense turf. And that overseeding uh, is generally followed by some kind of uh, aerations or, or some kind of uh, scratching on the turf with some aerators or birdie cutters or soil sleeters, those kind of machines. And with the aerations, uh, we generally recommend doing overseeding in fall. That's the ideal time, fall seeding followed by aerations, um, but in the spring, you can also do that. Um, however, it's a, there are a lot of challenges and things you have to be cautious about when you do in the spring. And I'm gonna talk about that. And this question was about that. So he, uh, the homeowner missed the fall seeding, which is the ideal time and in the springtime, can we do that or not? So one thing in fall is the soil is warming up, already warmed up, and we don't have to wait for that uh, 60 degree Fahrenheit temperature, which is the at least minimum soil temperature for, soil, for seed germinations. So that is already there in fall time, whereas in the spring, you have to wait. And sometimes you can get that in early March, but again, once your seed germinates, now your newly immersed seedlings, they are exposed to um, who knows what kind of weather comes up in late springs. Um, so not only you are, you have to wait for that seeds to germinate, but also the new seedlings that comes up on your yard, they have to go through extreme uh, or unpredictable weather conditions like drought, long spell of drought, extreme high temperature. Uh, if you do it in early spring, you might have some hard frost coming up. So these are the things that are risks that have to deal with when you do seeding in the spring, whereas there is no risk when you do in fall. And another very challenging thing with the spring seeding is the crabgrass. So if you have a perennial crabgrass problems in your yard, 
uh, then you better postpone your spring seeding because your new seedlings will now have to compete with crabgrass. Again, crabgrass is a warm season uh, weeds and they do not, uh, they germinate in the springtime, but they, they are already uh, dead in fall time. So you have to deal, the, your new seedlings have to deal with uh, crabgrass and compete for water, nutrients, sunlight and everything. So if you have a heavily infested crabgrass infested yard, then you better not do that in the spring. But if you have a manageable, uh, very low wheat pressures, then you can, you can um, plan on spring seeding as well. Similarly, the fungal disease, after your new seedlings, uh, once you get, out, get the new seedlings in the spring, now they're gonna be exposed to, again, the fungal disease pressure in the summer, uh, which is uh, uh, not far uh, if, your seeds are, if you are seeding late in the spring. So these are the challenges you have to uh, be aware of. And then another thing in the spring is, if you just uh, spray your yard, with some herbicides, what happens to your seeds, okay? And that's very common that people will spray on the, uh, on the spring, in the springtime for any herbicides. And if you are doing herbicide spray, then you have to be, again, be mindful on when, what should you do with the seeding. For example, here is the one, uh, the crabgrass preventer. Um, this is a pre-emergence herbicide. So they work like, uh, they will stop any seeds to, germinate and immerse. So they cannot um, emerge out of the ground. They will just prevent that. And this crabgrass preventer not only prevents your crabgrass, but also your grass seed. And interestingly, the waiting time, this um, pre-emergent herbicide, they have a long, long activity on the soil. So if you have pre-emergent herbicide um, on the ground, in February, in March, then you have to wait until 16 weeks and sometimes 20 weeks as well. So that will be the long waiting time and you cannot, um, um, you cannot plan to put down seeds if you have already done so at this point. So if you are planning for spring seeding, then you have to have a plan very early on, uh, actually in a year before that, so that you don't have that pre-emergent herbicide on your yard. And some of you uh, might do not do the pre-emergence, but if you, if you have done post-emergence or planning to do post-emergence and seeding, then please be mindful that post-emergence herbicides for your uh, broadleaf weeds, uh, they also have a waiting time of at least four weeks. You cannot put down seeds after spraying post-emergence herbicides. And so with that time window, it's gonna be tricky if your yard is suffering from heavy weeds infestations. But if your yard is clean and um, I mean, you're manageable in terms of weeds and you don't have that much of weed pressures, then you can do the spring seeding, okay? And here's just for example, here's the label I pulled up, I pulled up for this um, crabgrass preventer. And in the label, it says uh, clearly that the reseeding, overseeding or spreading should not be done within at least 10 weeks to 16 weeks. All right, I, that is all for me to talk about these uh, correlations and seedings in springtime. So to summarize that, uh, is it a waste of seed to uh, do the seeding in spring if you miss one in fall? Um, it depends on your conditions. And, and, and if you do not have pre-emergence herbicides, then you can do that. Um, if you think you can manage the uh, extreme weather conditions or on predictable weather conditions coming up. So you have to do more watering and um, versus uh, in fall time, you don't have to do a lot of watering as the temperature is already cooling down. All right, thank you so much for listening. That'll be it from my side. Thank you, Manoj. Lots of good information there. Okay, it is now time for Friend or Foe with Dr. Tamara Riel. Hello everyone. I am just going to pull this up. I am over in Kansas City and you can just hear the wind howling right now. We are waiting for that storm to come in. Okay. And all right, so there you go. Um, these are some insects that can be found inside or out. Um, 
they, it would be more likely to find them inside right now or in the next couple months. So I'm gonna activate this poll and let's let you guys see which you think it is. Is this an insect? <laughs> it is an insect. Is it a friend, a foe, neither? Um, does it depend? I'll give you a couple more seconds. Still a few people putting in their vote. All right. I'm going to give you three, two, one, and then I'm going to end the poll. All right. Let me show you guys what you voted on. So it looks like most of you say that this is a foe. Some of you said it's a friend, some said neither, and a few of you said it depends. So let's see what I said. All right. Well, actually, um, <laughs> that wasn't supposed to come up quite up yet, but this, this can be a foe if it's inside your house. On the other hand, if it's in the forest, it is a friend. So it depends. So I'm gonna say if you voted any of those, you can pat yourself on the back. So these are termites and they're the winged adults. If you find these in your house, that is a big problem um, and you need to take care of it. Uh, the Eastern subterranean termite is the most common termite that infests homes in Missouri. And this typically swarms between the months of like February. Um, it, it's in springtime, so it can start as early as February, but it might be March or April as well. And this, they usually swarm um, on a warm, sunny day that followed a rainstorm. So there are three other species of termites here in Missouri, but they're less likely to be found in your homes. Also, um, with you probably are well aware that subterranean termites um, can definitely cause damage to your home, but it usually doesn't happen like immediately. So if you do find these in your home, you do have time to make a good decision in contacting various companies and finding a certified company to treat your home. Um, they do cause a significant amount of damage, but it doesn't happen in days or weeks. It takes months or years. That said, if you're finding these in your home, then you have a, a mature colony that's been there probably for at least three years. So you do want to act soon, but you are able to make a good decision. On the other hand, outside, and um, as mentioned before, termites are an essential organism and they help break down woody material to help recycle those nutrients in our, in our environment. So it's up to you to determine how close to your home you can handle, but they are there unless your home was just built. And just, just really quickly, um, these termites that you can see on your screen, these, these are the workers. These are some that you might see in, in a lot of images. Um, you're really not gonna find these in your house unless you are taking the siding off or if you actually fall through you know, your floor or something like that. Um, but these, these are there. You might also find them in your garden if, you're, if you have a woody mulch or um, wood sides to a raised bed garden, you might find them there. Um, on the other hand, these are the adults. Um, when, and they, they will actually lose their wings when they find a place, when they land back on the ground and find a place where they're gonna start a nest. The way to tell the difference between flying ants and flying termites, I get this question a lot. Um, you can see some differences right here. So on, a, on an ant, they're gonna have these elbowed antennae um, and they're gonna have a, a really narrow waist and their wings are unequal lengths in comparison to the termites that have straight beaded antennae and they have this rather thick waist um, and then both of their wings are equal lengths, the hind wings as well as the fore wings. Now, um, again, uh, if, you, if you start finding some winged ants in your house, that could be a carpenter ant problem. So that could be a problem too, and you wanna get that treated. Um, but anyway, so this is, these are termites. Um, they're a foe in your house, but they are a friend outside, like maybe far away from your house. Um, but it, it really depends. So anyway, there you go, friend or foe, termites. Thank you, Tamara. We have another question on fruit and I am trying to find it. Sorry guys, it's a fruit question. And Pat Byers, if you're on, would you like to answer that? I think you know what the question is. If what the question is, is it's, it's someone who has this hillside and is looking to uh, put some plants on there and they're thinking that uh, fruit trees, vines or fruit bearing shrubs might be good to, put, to plant on a hillside and, and what is the best and easiest method for that? 
We just got a note from Pat Patrick saying that he can't unmute. So let's see if we can figure that one out. Uh, Jared, can you make him a, a co-host, please? That might be one of the problems. Okay. Uh, looks like I've been unmuted. Can you hear me? We can hear we you. We can hear you. Fabulous. Boy, it's really frustrating when you have a lot to say and you can't unmute. <laughs> well, um, so the, the question had to do with planting fruit plants on sloping sites. And one of the most precious resources in your yards and gardens is your soil. And you want to make every effort to preserve that resource. And particularly when you're thinking about planting things on slopes, this needs to be a very important consideration. Now, what you see in the literature and you hear experts talk about when it comes to planting on slopes is that anything 5% or over is at risk for erosion. Now, what is 5%? Well, that, that can be a little tricky just to eyeball, but an easy way to figure out if you have a 5% slope or greater is to take a stake, drive it at the top of your slope into the ground, then take a, a piece of string and a tape measure that can measure at least 20 feet out, measure 20 feet down the slope from your stake. Oh, sorry, back up. Tie your string to the base of the stake first, then measure uh, 20 feet down the slope, carry your string with you. And then you need to have a line level, which is a, um, a tool that um, carpenters and others use to, to get uh, lines that are, that are level. Put that onto your string and then raise that string up until it's level, and then measure the distance from that string to the ground. And if at 20 feet, it's one foot or greater, you have a 5% or greater slope. Well, what that means is that when you plant something on a slope, especially if it's going to be in, in a row setting, like a, a, a bed of raspberries or something like that, you wanna orient that row so that it follows the contour of the slope. In other words, it should run at right angles to the, the direction of, of down slope. And by doing that, just the presence of those plants at that right angle to the slope will help hold moisture in the, uh, in the area, but it will also most importantly hold the soil. So that's an important consideration. Now, the, the other considerations in planting fruit crops uh, apply, you know, whether or not you're looking at a slope site or you're looking at a, uh, a site that is, is more on the level. And again, that's to plant at the same depth that they were growing in the nursery. If you're planting bare root plants, make sure you spread the roots out so that uh, you don't uh, end up with the, the roots circling and confined to the hole. If you're planting a potted fruit plant, especially if it's in the pot for any length of time and you can see roots that have, have gathered or accumulated on the outer edges of the pot, you need to pull those loose with your fingers. Don't be afraid of, that you're injuring the plant by doing that. This is actually beneficial. So knock the plant out of its pot, use your fingers and pull these roots out and loosen them up so that they, they are no longer circling around the inside of the pot. And then when you plant and make sure that your planting hole is, is wide enough that you can adequately spread those roots out. It's also helpful to mulch plants on sloping sites because again, having, having a bit of a barrier to the movement of water down the slope will help hold the soil on your slope. So uh, Jennifer, I think that's that hopefully answers the question. If, if the person who submitted that uh, has anything else related to that question, please let us know and we'll, we'll tackle that as well. Okay, thank you, Patrick. And our next question is very timely as Valentine's Day was on Monday. And Donna Offenberg is going to talk about Valentine's flower care now. Hey, thank you, Jennifer. Um, so yes, Valentine's Day just occurred and I'm sure a lot of us receive wonderful, pretty flowers or plants uh, for Valentine's Day. So I'm just gonna hit on the high topic, uh, high points of how to take care of these. Get my slide to go, there we go. Um, on fresh flower care, um, always when you get your flowers, make sure to use a clean base and fresh water, of course. Um, and then also, if it comes with a packet of uh, flower food, put that in the water per the directions on the packet. And definitely recut your flower stems. And you want to take anywhere between an inch, two inches off, um, and then get them in the water immediately. Um, so you can cut these stems at an angle so they have more surface area to pull up that water. So the other important thing to do is make sure there's no foliage below the water line. And, and this has to do with, you want that water to stay as fresh as possible. You don't want bacteria or anything growing in it because that can cause the flowers to fade faster. So if you have foliage in the water, it tends to sour it and make it go bad faster. So definitely make sure to get all the foliage removed on the lower parts of the stem 
that will be under that water. If you're not using that uh, flour food or what we call preservative, make sure to change that water every day because once again, that water gets pretty sour and nasty pretty quick. And so, um, and, and so keep an eye on that and change that water frequently. Any flowers that start to fade after a couple of days, get them removed because that can also cause the base of flowers to get go bad quicker. Um, I know that my husband brought me flowers uh, before Valentine's Day, um, and I noticed that the asters and the daisies were already starting to fade. I hate to throw them out, but if I don't, it'll cause everything else to go bad faster. The other thing is keep the vase out of direct light, sunlight. Keep them cooler because the flowers will last longer. So if you tend to um, run your house a little warmer, you might put them in the cooler part of the house. But, but make sure to keep them where you're going to enjoy them. And the other thing is don't put them by an air duct or, or a heat register. That will also cause problems. So the cooler you can keep them, the longer your flowers are going to last. Now. Let's uh, switch gears here. Let's talk about the potted plants. So let's say you uh, ended up getting a plancho or um, African violet or something similar that, um, that, that is a flowering plant for Valentine's Day. Um, you can put those in indirect light, but you, you still want quite a bit of good light for them. Uh, make sure to take off any soil pot cover so that pole, that uh, foil that gets wrapped around them in any boat that needs to come off and that way it's not restricting air to get into the the, the roots and it's not um, holding excess moisture you want that off um, and so um, make sure to water it when the soil starts to dry out a lot of these plants don't like to be extremely dry so don't let them wilt you want to keep some moisture in them there, but do not overwater. Overwatering is the number one reason why our plants start to fail. Repot if the if if it seems root bound. But a lot of times these uh, flower flower shop type flowers like to be root bound. So don't be too quick, but also keep an eye on it and make sure that's not something that's going to be an issue. They do like bright lights, but once again, not direct sun. And then if you receive like tulips or hyacinths for Valentine's Day, uh, once that flower fades and, and that foliage starts to fade, you can plant them outdoors, but I wouldn't expect too much out of them because they have been forced to, do, to bloom prematurely and they just, they probably won't do much. Um, and Jennifer, that's all I have. So back to you. All right, thank you, Donna. And now Justin Kay is going to talk about the gardening calendar because it won't be long before we can start planting cool season vegetables outdoors. All right, thanks Jennifer. Get my slides going here. Are you seeing the presenter view or the participant view? I'm seeing the participant view. Okay. Well, All right. I'm seeing the just I'm seeing the one where there's maybe it, okay. I'm seeing two sides. The presenters. I'm, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Um, all right. So the vegetable planting calendar is an awesome resource um, for all you vegetable gardeners out there. Um, put together by MU Extension quite some time ago, but very simple. Easy to use guide, takes a lot of the guesswork out of vegetable gardening. Um, just to kind of give you a rough idea in Missouri, we're looking at our frost dates of October and April 15th, uh, respectively. The vegetable planting calendar really allows you <clears throat> to hit those optimum planting windows so you can get maximum production. Um, you know, we have both cool season and warm season vegetables, and they're going to thrive at different times of year. So um, your cool season vegetables, if you get them planted too late, for instance, you might have lettuce that is bitter. You might have spinach that bolts um, or puts on a seed head before it really produces. Um, so as best we can, we want to follow the vegetable planting calendar. 
Um, so just to give you an idea, Missouri is broken up into three different planting regions. We have North, Central, and South, but just do recognize that that Ozark Highland Plateau does fall with the North uh, planting dates. Some veggies in the vegetable calendar do have two planting dates um, for fall crops. So if you have never planted, for instance, like fall broccoli, um, Brussels sprouts, those crops do really well in the fall um, compared to the spring from my uh, personal experiences. So just to give you an idea about you know, very early season stuff, uh, four to five weeks before the last frost date. Um, you can see here broccoli, cabbage, kohlrabi, kale. Um, but to give you an idea, March 15th, um, depending on where you're at in the state, um, we have mid spring vegetables that aren't quite as freeze hardy, but they are frost tolerant, including our carrots, cauliflower, beets, Swiss chard, radish, and lettuce. Um, so those would could get planted in that first week of April. And then our warm season crops, we want to plant, we definitely want to wait till at least April 15th. And most of the time we're going to wait till later to get a lot of these uh, plants in because we could get a late frost. We could get those really cool, wet uh, spring days that could really hurt our young transplants. Now, our second round of fall plantings um, can go in August 1st through August 20th. So when we think about fall planting, oftentimes we don't think about it until the uh, pumpkin, you know, frappuccinos are on the menu. But we need to be thinking about this, um, you know, start thinking about this around the 4th of July if you want to start some transplants for your broccoli, your cabbage or Brussels sprouts. But you'll find that these crops really thrive as they come into the fall as the months cool down. So this is what this vegetable planting calendar looks like. Um, very simple design here. We have our planting dates on the right-hand side for uh, South Central and Mid Missouri. Um, you can see down at the bottom here, I've highlighted beets. So we could start as early as March 1st. Um, and then you'll see the fall dates listed as well. So, uh, you know, this just kind of gives you a little more idea of some of the information that can be found here. Um, this is a slide for tomato plants from the vegetable planting calendar. All these different varieties that are listed will have their days to maturity as some, well as some of their characteristics. Um, that big beef variety is popular. You can see those letter codes respond to different disease resistance codes, which can be found on the left here. It also gives you a lot of information about seed and spacing. So it gives you information about how much to plant per person, uh, seed required for 100 feet of row, distance between the rows, um, whether it's hand cultivated or field cultivated, and the distance between plants in the row. So the in-row spacing here. It also gives you the seed depth as well as days from planting to harvest. So a lot of information packed um, in this resource here. Uh, just to give you an idea with tomatoes, we can use the information on the spacing as well as the planting dates to kind of just lay out our plan of attack for uh, our planting tomatoes. But the MU vegetable planting calendar, it's, it's pretty comprehensive. It's got most vegetables on there um tailored to Missouri planting dates so make sure you check that out and share that resource with your friends because there's a lot of great information packed in there thank you Justin and now I will turn it back over to Debbie great presentations great um questions that have come in from all of you out there we love answering your questions so come back at us and continue to ask us questions because we'll provide you with the answers. We, I do wanna remind you that the next um, garden hour is going to be March 16th, and it is the third Wednesday of the month from noon to one. I also wanna remind you that Monday is President's Day and Jennifer Shooter wrote an excellent article about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson's gardens. And I'm gonna ask Tamara to drop that link into the chat box to Jennifer's newsletter. 
Uh, you definitely want to read that because if, if you love gardens and love gardenings and you're out on the East Coast near those uh, presidents' uh, ranches, homes, farms, you definitely want to stop in and see that. And then I'm also dropping into the chat box as well the um, actual links to their particular homes, and you can look on those sites as well after you read Jennifer's article. We want to thank you for being with us today. Have a great month. In the meantime, feel free to get back in touch with us because we're very happy to visit with you. See you later.